Now that we've seen one example about spacing in the frequency domain, we can uh, go on to a more general discussion of spectral efficiency. And again, spectral efficiency, we're still in the same section of our textbook from Sklar. So I'm going to give a definition now by what I mean by the term spectral efficiency, and I often use the uh, Greek letter uh, eta to rec represent that. So it's going to be the ratio of the um, uh, bit rate divided by the occupied bandwidth. So uh, eta is equal to the bit rate divided by the occupied bandwidth. So that's in general a, d a definition. So how fast do I have to send through how much spectrum? Now we're going to want to compare um, modulation formats and their inherent spectral efficiency. And so we're going to sort of make some assumptions on, for example, the occupied bandwidth. You remember that there's this idea of a Nyquist pulse, which is the narrowest, like the most efficient you could be for occupied bandwidth. So when I want to compare them, I want to put, compare them all on the same basis. So what I'm going to do is, suppose everybody used the approach that was the most spectrally efficient possible. So the occupied bandwidth was as small as you possibly could get. So I'm going to do that for everybody. And so now when I compare, it's that. Of course, when I get to a real system, a real system, you know, I might use race cosine, I might use some other things. The occupied bandwidth may change, but when I'm comparing them, I'm comparing them with the same assumption. So bit rate, what does bit rate mean? Well, that's one over the um, bit rate, uh, bit interval, sorry. So T of B is the, the, the interval of time for one bit. One over TB is how many bits per second. Uh, often, I'm going to want to go back and forth between symbol time and bit time. And that's because the occupied bandwidth is determined by TS. Okay? Depending on which um, uh, modulation format I'm using, what value of M, the occupied bandwidth is a function of TS. So I need that log 2M. So that's why I'm mentioning this relationship, because it's going to come up in our calculations. So again, it's used to compare modulation. And again, I'm going to assume that the occupied bandwidth is the smallest possible. The Nyquist uh, ideal uh, pulse shape is used in the time domain to make sure that in the frequency domain, I have a rectangular spectrum, and it's as small as possible. OK, I said that when we uh, use an expression, when we uh, derive an expression for the spectral efficiency of a given modulation format, I'm going to assume that modulation format is using the most bandwidth efficient uh, pulse shaping possible. So it's using a Nyquist pulse shape. So before we looked at um, time domain that had uh, square pulses, now if I were going to look in the time domain, instead they would be uh, sync pulses. So I'd have some sync pulse here. I'm not very good at drawing sync pulses. But it's one after the other after the other of these. So wow, I can't draw them. And they're even invisible here. Let me see if I can make them a little more visible. OK, so I have one sync pulse after the other after the other. And I don't, like I said, I don't draw them very well, but you get the idea. <laughs> time domain, time domain. Now what does that mean in the frequency domain? Well, the frequency domain, it is the most compact possible. The most compact shape possible is a rectangle. So I have a rectangle in the frequency domain, and the um, uh, width of this um, uh, bandwidth from here to here is uh, 1 over t. So here is 1 over 2t for one-sided, and it's 1 over t is the minimal uh, width uh, in this case. Uh, here we have. Um, uh, unity um, energy, so that if the width is 1 over t, then I make the height t, just to, to normalize everything to unit energy. Ah, and I had a nice drawing all along. So forget this. This is what it looks like in the time domain. So let's go back to our previous discussion of coherent FSK. Before when I said I'm going to stack m symbols in the frequencies, one after another, as tightly spaced as possible, I came up with this 
calculation n minus 3 divided by 2t, or n plus 3, sorry, divided by 2t. But in that case, I was using square pulses in the time domain, which gave me sync pulses in the frequency domain. So that was okay to give you the basic idea, but now what I want to do is I'm going to say, no, no, suppose that I'm not using rectangular in the time domain. Suppose I'm using a sync function in the time domain, which means I'm using rectangular in the frequency domain. So I'm using an ideal Nyquist pulse. So now instead of being sync functions, they're just these squares. They're just these rectangles right here you see. And the thickness of each one is 1 over t. So here the yellow one is 1 over t, et cetera, at f1. The next one is the blue one, which has, uh, again, its width is 1 over t, but it's centered now at f2. And this separation between f1 and f2 is 1 over 2. Uh, t because that's what we found was a minimum separation for coherent FSK. Now if I stack these rectangles one after another, then if I look at the distance from the first symbol, the beginning of the first symbol to the end of the last symbol, the nth symbol, what I get is uh, m plus 1 divided by 2t. So you can see that if I assume that I was using square pulses in the rectangular, uh, rect square pulses in the time domain, then it would occupy more bandwidth and my expression would be different. So again, I'm going to use the ideal Nyquist in order to compare this performance with others. And so in the ideal case, you know, we save a little space by packing them in tighter by having them be uh, more, uh, the most compact pos possible. So now we can write our general expression for the bandwidth efficiency of coherent MFSK. So this was our general definition, and now I want to put in that the bandwidth, W, the occupied bandwidth we've just seen, was m plus 1 divided by 2 uh, Ts, because it's the time of a symbol that determines the width in the bandwidth. Um, so we put that in, and we uh, can replace the Tb by Ts divided by long 2m, and we cancel out the TSs, and what we come up with is the spectral efficiency is 2 log 2m divided by m plus 1. And the units for spectral efficiency are always bits per second per hertz. Bits per second from the R and divided by uh, bandwidth, which is hertz. So bits per second per hertz. Uh, sometimes you think of it as being dimensionless uh, because um, 1 over second is hertz. Uh, but the, the correct units are uh, bits per second per hertz. Now let's look at non-coherent detection, F for FSK. And in this case, uh, again, we're going to look at the square. So we have the same you know, uh, rectangular shape of width 1 over t. But now, instead of being overlapping, which we were allowed to do in, non in the coherent detection, in non-coherent, they have to be contiguous, one after the other. They don't actually uh, overlap. Uh, because the separation now is uh, 1 over t, which is um, the same as the width. So in this case, separation between center frequencies is 1 over t, and the width of each one of these rectangles is 1 over t. So if I look at the beginning of the first symbol, just to the end of the last symbol, I get m uh, divided by uh, t as the uh, occupied spectrum. So I can take this observation for the uh, spectral efficiency replaced with the occupied um, uh, bandwidth now. And now instead of being, um, now we have m divided by ts, which gives me a new expression for the uh, bandwidth efficiency for non-coherent detection, which is log 2m over m. Okay, now I'd like to give us a feel for what's going on with the bandwidth efficiency for FSK, because it's maybe the most challenging to understand that equation of a log over an, uh, a linear. So to understand that, I'm going to take an example where I, I fix the, the bit rate. Uh, excuse me, the, the, the bit rate, exactly. I fix the number of bits per second. So if I were to look at the binary case in the time domain, and I'm going to write them as rectangles, but of course we wouldn't, well, this example is sort of our rectangles, just to give you the idea. So this would be the time of a bit, which is equal to the time of the symbol for, for uh, binary. Now, I'm fixing it so that when I send QPSK, 
The time of a bit is the same, but I'm going to send two bits in the time of a symbol. Now if I use 8 FSK, I'm going to send three bits, uh, but I'm going to send it in the time of a symbol. Right? So here I'm sending one bit, 0101. Zero, one, zero, one. Here I'm going to send 00 zero together as an angle, and that one angle is going to give me two bits, so I can take my time, because I don't have to go, I'm going to fix the bit rate. The bit rate is the same, so I can take my time. Right? And so now I can take twice as long to send an angle, and that'll give me two bits. Here I can take three times as long, because I'm sending one of eight angles, and I can send three bits. So here the, the, the binary, the bit rate, bits per second is fixed. I'm not sending any information faster, but as m gets bigger, my time for a symbol is getting bigger, which means in the frequency domain it's getting smaller. So I get to make, here they're pretty fat, each time they're getting thinner. They might get thinner, but I have to have more of them, right? Because I have to have one frequency for each one of the symbols. QFSK, I got four of them. So now we can see this idea of logarithmic and linear, because as we uh, go on, m is getting bigger, the symbol time is getting bigger, 1 over the uh, TS is getting smaller. So I went from fat and I went down to thinner. But, uh, of course, I have to uh, multiply them. Uh, so the total occupied bandwidth is, of course, getting bigger. Looks the same at, at QFSK, but once I get to 8FSK, the occupied bandwidth is getting bigger. And so that is why we get log 2m over m uh, for the uh, FSK um, uh, non-coherent case.